Hi everybody, welcome back to Project Happy Home. For those of you who are new here, I'm Tanya, a doctor, lawyer, turned homeschool mom of three kids ages 10, seven, and five. If you're interested in videos about secular homeschooling, raising a child with ADHD, and living a more essentialist lifestyle, you have come to the right place, so be sure to hit that subscribe button down below. In today's video, I am so happy to be collaborating with my friend Joy again, and we are actually trying to do a split screen interview for the very first time. And hopefully it will go well because the first time it didn't, but being essentialist, we built an extra time. So here we are today to re-record this for you. And I'm going to send it over to Joy so that she can introduce herself. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is the last video that we're doing in our essentialism series. This is video number four. So if you missed the first three, make sure and check those out. Um, we are going to talk about the last part of this book. Um, my name is Joy and I have three kids. They are 13, 11, and nine. And I have been doing classical homeschooling since the beginning, basically, with my um, oldest. And I, that's, that's it. That's all I got for my intro. <laughs> it's not nearly as polished as Tanya's, but I love it. So we're going to just dive right in um, to the fourth section of this book, which is talking about execution, which is perfect because you now know all about it. And now how does it actually play out in our daily life? So the first topic for discussion is the buffer. So Tanya, let's talk a little bit about the buffer. So I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with the word buffer and basically, you know, that idea of buffer is putting a barrier between you and whatever can harm you, right? So like when we have a buffer zone by the side of a road, it's so that, you know, things don't harm whatever's on the road or vice versa. <laughs> like the things on the road don't harm what's on the other side of it. And you can think of it the same way in your own life. So like the concept they talk about in the book is building in buffers, not only of space and time, but also just your boundaries in general, like building in that, you know, space for things to fail, not always assuming everything's going to work out perfectly fine for you. So how would you say that's impacted your real life, Joy? Well, I thought it was great that you brought this situation into it because yesterday we tried to record this and we had all sorts of technical difficulties. And this chapter really talks a lot about the only thing that you can expect is the unexpected. And so building in that buffer to your life where you're not feeling completely stressed out. Like we wanna, we wanna post this on a Friday. So if we would have left it till like Thursday afternoon and we would have had um, no time to build in that buffer, we wouldn't have had a buffer. And so then it would have been stressful or we would have had to push the date back. And so just trying to record on a Monday, but that didn't work. Now recording on a Tuesday, it just kind of lifts that stress a little and um, makes you really feel like you still are somewhat in control <laughs> of the situation and not just taken away by um, things that are happening to you. For sure. I think that for me, like I'm particularly bad at assuming that things are going to take a certain amount of time when really they're going to take this much longer. And I've had that my entire life. I think it's partly because I have ADHD tendencies myself. So I have a little bit of time blindness. Luckily, I think I'm also very effective under pressure because having had time blindness for my entire life has led me to like be able to do things in a compressed amount of time. The book also talks about that idea, right? Of like any project, like a gas expanding to fill the amount of time you have to do it in. And so that concept of like starting early, what, what do they call that again? Like time fallacy or something? Yes. In the book? Yes, I think so. What's the, a planning fallacy, right? Where we assume things are going to be you know, something's gonna take 20 minutes, but really it's gonna take like 30 or 40. Something's gonna take like two days of planning or two days of execution. And it's really gonna take like a week. Um, he suggests building in a buffer of 50%, which seems huge at the beginning. And honestly, nowadays for big projects, I just build in a double buffer, like of like 100%. I'm like, because things go wrong. And like, now there's more people at play in my life than just me. It's not like me in college where, Right. I could handle a compressed amount of time and handle my own variables. It's like all my children and my husband and his work schedule and all of the other things that happen, like hurricanes and quarantines. Right. And, and quarantine. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So. And I, I think once you've done a few house projects or any sort of project where you allot a certain amount of money, 
you get to the end of that project and you realize that buffer, because they suggest that <laughs> helps projects. And so you realize that buffer is super important because, and true, every time you amount a certain, yeah. a lot, a certain amount of money, it's always going to be like, I don't know, not quite double, but very close to that. So the 50% buffer yeah. is so smart. Exactly. And every time you think you're going to need like 18 knobs, you're going to need 19. Just, just buy the 19th one. Right. Like that's a, like a home improvement tip. If you ever are confused about the number, or even if you know the number, buy an extra one. You can return it later. Like buy an that extra. is building in. Like, yeah. so that's that idea, right? Of preparing for every kind of eventuality. They talk about that trip to Antarctica too, with the two explorers, you know, Amund Amundsen, and someone else who had a great name, like Falcon Scott, <laughs> who you, you kind of think would win, but like dies on the way because he didn't prepare for anything. Right, and right. the uh, Amundsen prepares for like everything and had three times the amount of food and like four times the amount of thermometers and made it. Um, so yeah, just prepare. In terms of homeschooling, I would say that this is why I do a lot more reverse planning than forward planning. Like I forward plan loosely, like by week or by month, I'm like, in this general time frame, I should like to complete this. But I mean, man, like my first year homeschooling, like I had like, on this day, we shall do. <laughs> like, it, I planned the entire year, Joy. I didn't even do like four weeks. I was like, I got this. I'm just gonna right? do, this is gonna be our year. And like that fell apart, like by like three days in. Oh yeah. And I, was, I mean, that beautiful planner was just like, it was a disaster. I had so many flags for all the places I was in it. Yeah. I really suggest if you're a new homeschooler, especially don't do that to yourself. Like try to try to give yourself some grace early, you know, <laughs> like loosely plan. If you want to be strict, um, plan maybe like a week at a time or like right. two, right. not the entire year. <laughs> yes. Yes. That is so important because I think everybody does it, but it is so important not to do that. Um, to plan your whole year because the second you get behind, it creates that stress. So the next part is talking about subtract and that's removing more obstacles in your path. And I, I loved this chapter for the slowest hiker um, yeah. reference. And it was talking about uh, what are the obstacles in between you and getting done what you wanna get done. And so then you identify what's between you and getting that thing done. And that is your slowest hiker. It can be a person, it can be motivation, it can be a lot of different things. Um, they list those out in the book, which is another plug for getting the book because there's so much more information than what we're, we're actually talking about. But I love that concept of um, thinking about like what you wanna do and getting it done. Because I struggle with this all the time when I have a list that's a mile long and it just thinking about it in those terms, like what is between me and getting the things that have been on my list for three weeks done? And even if it's motivation, like just uh, allowing yourself to understand that about where you're at right there, um, I think that can propel us forward and maybe just say, you know what, motivation is not coming right now, so I'm gonna pare it down to like one thing. Even if I get one thing done, at least something's getting done on the list. And I really like that. So how does that play out for you, Tanya? Yeah, I actually love the name he gave it, you know, like finding your Herbie, because the slowest hiker in his story is given the hypothetical name Herbie. Your name is Herbie, I'm sorry about that. But like, <laughs> You know, and he puts the slowest hiker at the front. Initially, he was having the faster hikers go first and the slower hikers go in the back, but he couldn't keep track of both of them in this Cub Scout group or something. And so then he put the fastest hiker in the front, but then everybody kind of, you couldn't, like, everybody was walking at different speeds. But if you put the slowest hiker in the front, then everyone kind of falls in line. And then if you improve the slowest hiker, like that obstacle, like if you work on that thing, everything else starts moving faster. So all the things you already have in place can like work better on a machinery, you know, course, or I don't know what you would call that a machinery run. Yeah. And that concept really made sense to me because sometimes in homeschooling, especially you'll have like this one thing that trips you up, like whether it's like that transition from like breakfast to like getting to the schoolroom, or whether it's like someone just lagging over math, like that one kid who's like making it like a thing for everybody else, you know, like, Whatever that is, like identify that, 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 that stop in your day, you know, the thing that pushes back against you. And sometimes it's that 
you wake up after the kids. You know, sometimes it's something simple like that. Like you wake up and now you're grumpy because, you know, or yep. people woke you up or you have a child staring you in the face <laughs> like seven in the morning. And like, that's how you wake up every day. Like whatever your Herbie is, I think it's important to like identify that, that stop and like work on that. Like make that your project for like the month. Make only that your project and see how everything else sort of like rolls better. Yes. Because I think, yeah, like sometimes we're too hard on ourselves. We think everything's falling apart or everything's not working when really it's just like one or two things. So like getting a real idea of what those are and fixing that can make the rest of it Fall roll in. in. Yep. Well, and I yeah. love how the last page of that chapter talked about that a lot of times it is due to lack of planning, like not having the time to plan. Um, he even mentions like a story about him and his wife and his wife was raising small kids and she just felt like constantly just kind of spinning her wheels. And so they identified it as she didn't have time to like go somewhere and think and plan out her week and just kind of try and get a, a grasp on what was happening in their lives. And so um, they built in that space, however you want to do that. I mean, I, I actually had the same issue when I had yeah. little kids because it's so constant. And so like Sunday nights, I would just go to Barnes and Noble or somewhere and I would just mm -hmm. sit with my planner and kind of plan out the week and think about it. And that was so helpful. Do you, did you ever do anything yeah. like that? I never got a chance because back then my husband used to stay call. But, um, you know, like I just, I tried to, I think what changed for me was waking up before the kids, like making that a real like priority in my life. And I, I mean like waking up like two hours before they wake up so that I can have like a leisurely time to like put on my sunscreen and read my books and make my bed. And so by the time someone sees me, I've already had like a good amount of me time. And I feel like my day has been about more than just being a mom. Like for me, that was really, really important to get my head on straight so that I could be gracious with my kids. And that that really began with that self-respect for myself, you know, like yes, 100%. just taking care of like protecting the asset, like what we talked about yes. before. Yes. It's really about that. I mean. Right. And being true to who you are. And if you don't have enough time during the day to even think two thoughts together, then you don't have the time to think about yourself and what you might need to succeed. For sure. So the next section they talk about within the execute chapter is progress. And basically they talk about starting small and like celebrating your small wins and having visual charts. And this is really relevant to homeschooling. So how would you say that you like folded this chapter into your life? Um, you know, it, at first I was trying to make one list for everything and like chores and school and the whole bit. And now I realize like we need parts to our day. So when we get up, we have like our little chore chart. It's very simple, but it just kind of helps keep kids on track. Um, we used to do the little pictures when they were little, but now they can actually read it. Um, and now it includes things like you know, put on your deodorant or whatever. Um, so I really like having a little chore chart that the kids can work on as I'm working on my morning chores. And then we have a school um, list. And some of my kids really thrive off of a list. All of them use one, but some of them thrive more off of that. And it um, mm -hmm. kind of encourages them along the, their school day. Um, but it helps me to see and be able to very quickly run through debt. Like, have you done this, this, and this, you know, especially as they get older and can kind of do things on their own. So I think just helping them, I don't have rewards for those charts, but I definitely have, uh, I feel like they feel like, okay, we've gotten these things done. We're able to move on to the next thing. And that just, it helps us all around. Like we've really fallen into a groove during the school year of like, this is kind of our before school routine. This is our during school routine. And then after school, we don't really have a routine and that's awesome. <laughs> and they really look forward to that too. So uh, I feel like that has been super helpful at making us successful in our homeschool. Um, I've done different chore charts or different not chore charts, but different um, little prizes for them for doing certain things throughout the day, especially attitudes, like when yeah. you have a good attitude, when you do this, this, and this, you get to pick something out of the prize, you know, bucket or whatever. Um, and that was helpful, especially when they were younger. And I'll, I'll be honest, sometimes I bring it back when we've really struggled. Um, but those kind of things help 
um, help my kids. Now, for me, I actually have my own little uh, small wins. <laughs> so if I if I get through a morning of school and I've like you know not lost my temper or things like that, I will go and grab myself a coffee or do something, and it just kind of makes me look forward to something, and that's really helpful in a homeschool day because I feel like a lot of times they can just all look the same. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I think that's a really good idea. I've never thought about giving myself little like rewards, but I should. I should. I think I would respond really well to that. <laughs> well, because you do the bracelet things, right? I do do the bracelet things. I'm not wearing them today. My daughter was like, where are your earrings? I was like, I forgot everything today. But normally I wear these jelly bangles and I start off with them in one hand. And every time something good happens with my kids, like I used to do it with like, you know, whether I did something bad or I like had a meltdown or something, I would like use it as a tracker of my own behavior, but then I shifted it completely. And I, every time something good happens, period, like I move it over, like a, a moment that I think is good, whether I'm like happy about how they like folded their socks or uh, someone gives me a hug in the morning and I, my bracelets keep moving back and forth. And that's such a good, like, like physical, tangible reminder of how many good things happen during a day. You know, like it just helps me to not dwell in melancholy because I have a tendency to do that. And yeah. so, you know, like I think that if you are that type of person, giving yourself some little cue of like the good things is really, really helpful. Like someone, there's that app that you can download, um, the Orange Rhino app. And it's like you track how long it's been since you yelled at your kids. I fail at that miserably. But she has a thing where you're supposed to put like orange rhinos everywhere. Oh. And that's like a visual cue to you. Like, don't, don't kill. And to me, the bracelets are my visual cue to like, just appreciate the good things. Like all those little good things that build up. So I have like 20 bracelets and they keep moving back and forth. Like, it's amazing when you, when you see it that way, you know, yes. like there might've been two really bad things that happened during the day, but there was like 40 incredibly nice things. Yes. So. It's such a great way to be intentional. I love that you do that. Yeah. And I would say another thing that this chapter talks about is making routines easy. So you were saying like, you know, the, with the charts and stuff, like the chart isn't so much like a tracker for like giving a reward, right? It's like making something easier for them, you know? And for me, like we have this resistance to charts in our household because my kids don't like charts. Though they were very, very helpful when they were small and I had like pictorial charts. And if you want some, like just email me at contact project happy home because I have a nice picture chart for a girl and a boy for a morning routine and a nighttime routine. It's all on one page. Um, and that was really helpful for getting them going with that. My kids don't need it anymore, but they know what to do in the morning. They know what to do at night. Like they know. And the, it, the chart really helped them. Yes. I was thinking this year though, because I do think a list is helpful at, at marks throughout the day. I was thinking about making a um, placemat and having it laminated, you know, like a big one, like a 17 yeah. by whatever and taking it to Office Depot or something and just having like a path. So like if you've gotten to lunch, these things have been done. And then it, by the time you get to dinner, these things have been done. Just so when they sit down, they can be like, oh, lunch, all of this should have been done. Oh, dinner, all of this should have been done, you know, just so they can see. That's really and cool. the location makes it easy, right? Because you are going to see your place now when you sit down. <laughs> Yeah. So I was just going to leave it at the island. Just keep it there. It's no reward. It's no, no one's checking it. It's just for you to like stay accountable to yourself. When they're younger, it's really hard to have a routine. I mean, at least it was for me. Maybe that's not true for everyone. But as they've gotten older, it's just, I mean, it's really hard not to have a routine, I feel like. Sometimes it's nice to mix it up. But for the most part, so kids know, like, you know, my boys really love video games. So it's not that they're waking up every day and saying, when can we play? When can we play? Like they know if they get their school done, they can play at four o'clock, you know, that kind of a thing. So it takes a lot more. Um, it's like making that decision once. So you don't have to like make the decision or say it a million times uh, yeah. throughout your day. And so I think that is so um, key for homeschoolers to have a routine of some kind. It doesn't have to be super structured. You know, I think we hear routine and we think, oh gosh, it's like time, you know, time blocking. There's like something to do every yeah. time, every second of the day. I don't think that's necessarily what they're saying is just the same flow throughout your day. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's really helpful. Like, you know, I automate our weeks by every kid having two days of the week that's theirs. And it just cycles by age. So, you know, my eldest starts on Sunday, the middle child is on Monday, the next one's on 
Tuesday and then my eldest child has Wednesday again and then Saturday is a free for all. But basically on every day they know they're responsible for their laundry that day. They're the first picker, which means they get to choose like the TV show we might watch or the car song in the, you know, in the car or the podcast or whatever they get to choose, but they also get to be first helper that day, which means that if I need extra help with something that's not their general chore, like they're on call for me and that's fine because they know it's their day and they also get the good stuff, you know, but it's automated. So I don't have to say like, there is no discussion like, Oh, like so-and-so like, you know, like didn't do it for a long time. It doesn't matter. Like it's your day. And that's all I say. If anybody has any kind of issue with anything, I'm like, it's your day. And I do that with the good stuff and the bad stuff. So like if somebody wants to watch, you know, the floor is lava and somebody else wants to watch, there's a new sugar show where people build like sugar desserts. And like, (laughs) I'm like, it's your day. Like it's this yeah. person's day, it's their choice and that's it. And there doesn't have to be this perpetual, ongoing, repetitive, like argument about responsibilities and like privileges, you know, it is, it is what it is. Yes. And I also like that it automates like a lot of your household chores automatically, like laundry. Like I know the kids are getting their laundry done once a week because they right. did it on the day. Like it's as simple as that. So, you know, that kind of stuff really helps. Yes. Did I tell you I actually implemented that in my house? But we have um, after dinner helpers. And I, I was uh-huh. like, oh, yeah, Tanya has her kid do, you know, has her kids like rotate through yeah. the day or through the days of the week. And so I did yeah. that. But it's my after dinner helpers. And so yeah. Roman gets Monday and he mm-hmm. is like, hey, you get to come help me with dinner. We're still working on it. We're still making yeah. it a habit. But it is so great. I love that idea so much. So I was like, mm-hmm. I'm going to implement that in some way, shape or form. Um, And I love that this chapter points out that uh, they actually, to quote it, it says, changing even the simplest, tiniest habit is amazingly, disturbingly hard. (laughs) I felt like that just gave so much life. I underlined that too. (laughs) Yes. I was like, yes, thank you. Thank you for showing me that it is really, really hard, you know, kind of admitting that because it is hard. Even like waking up before your kids, it's hard, you know, it's not easy. Yeah. yeah, it took a while. I mean, honestly, like I developed, I would say one habit like in 2018 and that was waking up before my kids. Like that was the habit I developed, the one thing that succeeded, you know, that became a consistent habit. And then I would say the next year, my one habit was making my bed. <laughs> like, that was my one habit, like making it like the moment I got out of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I think sometimes people think that they're going to implement like all of this greatness and like by june we're gonna be good to go like for the rest of your life and that's just not the way it is i definitely thought that when i was growing up i thought at 24 my life would be like like wrapped up in a neat bow and like i would be this perfect version of a human being in a perfect house with perfect children and a perfect marriage right none of those things happened i had it i think i met my husband but i don't think we had any plans to get married at that point There were no children. I mean, I think that when we become homeschool moms, we have the same idea, right? That like, especially moms like us who like read the books and do the research, we're like, oh, how beautiful. Look at this beautiful morning basket concept. And like, by osmosis. I know. Like, I am going to read like the diluted version of Charlotte Mason and I'm going to get it. Like, it's all going to be super. I'm going to read the core and it's just going to be. You know, like, yeah, like, and none of that happens. And I think sometimes when we all talk about these books and talk about habit formation, people hear like all of these things that have taken years to develop, you know, and think, okay, I'm going to do this in a couple of weeks. And I, and just know that none of us have it down. Like everything's ongoing and everything keeps changing because your kids keep getting older, your life changes. Like, you know, give yourself grace. This is my point with this. Like, don't think that you're going to read this book and like in three months, you're just going to be this person who's saying no to everything, who's got your ducks in a row. Nope, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, and I thought another interesting point that he brought up was that every habit is, um, there's like a cue or a routine or a reward that's kind of like tied to it. And I thought that was so interesting, Mm -hmm. especially because I have been all summer, I've been like walking and then I water my plants and the days that I don't walk, my poor plants don't get watered because it's, it's like connected, you know, there's a cue there. 
And when the cue is gone, I just, it flies out of my mind, like unless I have it written down somewhere. And I find that fascinating because it's just interesting how your brain works and how those things are tied together. Yeah, I think what I like, have you read that book by James Clear, The Habit Book? Uh, the Seven the Habits, habits of Or is it The Power of Habit? I don't know. What oh, I read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, I think. Is that a different Oh, that's like, right? That's right. Yep. No, I haven't read that we one. Should, we should do the other one, the one by James Clear, which, <gasps> yes, we should do. It's a good book. That's what that quote cool comes from. And, like, oh, yeah. I mean, that, that concept of, like, you know, the whole habit building section. Yes, the power of habit. There we go. The power of habit. Yeah. yeah. So I've listened to that one on Audible, and I want to get that one the same way that happened for me with this book. Okay. Because... It really does build on these little things. Like we can hear those easy little phrases, like it takes 21 days to build a habit, blah, blah, right. and do nothing with that information. But he really pieces it out in like how to make that habit easy, how to track that you're actually getting to that habit. And I would say one thing about habits is that we also have negative ones that are similarly associated with the, that same cue. And I would say one of my negative habits, all my friends know, Joy knows, like my thing is messes. Like I just, I, I have a thing about mess. Like I can't, I have plenty of mess in my room. I'm like going around. My mess is not the problem. My mess is like Lego mess and sock mess and random messes that make no sense to me. Yes. And one of my habits had become like to go into the kids' rooms to read to them at night. And then I would like have a little meltdown about the mess and then we'd clean up and then read. And it sort of made that time not as nice as it used to be. So then I just changed my cue and I told my husband, I was like, you handle the nighttime good nights there. I will take the children in our bedroom and read to them. And that way I divorce that cue, you know, yes. from yes. that thing. And sometimes I think we need to do that for self-care and just yes. to be our best selves, you know, yes. like recognize your trigger and your cue and like divorce it. And now that I've done that for a couple like months, it's easier for me to go in the room because it's been a few months since I've had that like meltdown. So now yeah. I can go in and be like, oh, you still have a mess. Great. Yeah. Like, and you know, like it's really good to like give yourself some room. And awesome. that goes back to what we were talking before that buffer as moms, sometimes the input is just too much, Yeah. you know, like you don't have a chance to catch your breath and like reset yourself. Yeah. So give it, give that to yourself as well. When you notice your bad habits, like give yourself space from them instead of always trying to like improve yourself, you know? Right. Right. I think that so. is, completely spot on. Yes. Um, it also talks about mixing up your routines a little bit in here and mm -hmm. um, starting with one change in your daily or weekly routine. And we, I think we kind of covered that, but that is truly how you have to start it out. Like you just can't yeah. change it all overnight. And they talk about how routines are actually very deep and emotional things. <laughs> and I, just, I don't think I'd ever read that before. And I was like, mm, that's very true, you know, like very yeah. true. So there was something I underlined in that section and it said that your retreat, you should create routines that enshrine the essential. And I love that expression, you know, instead of routines that are just things you think should happen in a certain way, like yes. make routines that enshrine the essential, like figure out again, what your core values are. What are you trying to get to with this routine? You right. know, like one of my core values is like tidiness. <laughs> like it is like having like a calm and, like you know put back home like yep. and that that routines like when i build them i should build them to honor that right you know not just for the sake of like having a perfect house or whatever right you know it should get you to your value not just randomly like what you think you should be doing excellent yes excellent point yeah because it's like a lot of times i will look at myself and be like well i need to change or i i just need to get over it but again and again, I don't get over it. And so looking at how you can change it in your habit and in your daily life is, yeah, that's really, really important. And I, I will say one of the biggest things in this chapter was get the future out of your head. For me, like I constantly, I am that person who looks forward. What was the, what was the thing in this book? I think it was an example in this book where it said that somebody had been looking forward to riding a ride or maybe I was listening to this. Anyways, I can't remember where I heard it, but somebody yeah. was writing, or looking forward to this new ride opening. They looked forward to it for like a year, and then they're finally on the ride, 
and they're like talking to the person next who they went with to ride this ride about the next ride they're gonna ride because they're like just constantly skipping ahead you know and i realized i think it was actually the enneagram and it, that was totally like my personality on the enneagram so it makes it really hard for me to not to like enjoy the present and so yeah. this really spoke to me i was like yes get the future out of your head just enjoy the now that's why i like your bracelets so much i think yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have that problem, too, even though I'm a very different Enneagram than you. Joy's yes. like a seven, and I'm like a four. <laughs> but I think it actually confused sometimes. Like, some people yeah. think people as a four or a seven, and it's, so I think I've heard that. Yeah, there's a lot of, like, I think head thought going on in both yeah. groups. And so there's a lot of living in, like, potentialities as opposed to, like, reality. Right. <laughs> like, you know, one in the more, I think, happy way and one in the more melancholy way. Yes. But yeah, so they had these two words that they talked about in that chapter, the Kronos and Kairos. And Kronos is this idea of like chronological time, you know, first this, then that. And Kairos is this idea of time as in the moment, you know, like so that idea of like trying to be more Kairos like in the moment and like really seeing what's here. So yes. in terms of thinking like an essentialist, even though there is a lot in this book about planning ahead and like building buffer and all of that much more so it's like automating your life so that you no longer have to like be so wedded to a plan you know it's so that all of these things become part of who you are like saying the graceful no planning for like catastrophes like knowing that things might not going wrong knowing that things might not go right and like being okay with that you know and being like ready for things to shift and change and that incorporating that flexibility with clear boundaries, I think, is yes. what this book is about, you know? Yeah. Yes. So. Well, and, and allowing yourself to think about the future and to make those decisions for the future so you don't then have to kind of feel like you're putting out fires all day because you haven't made those decisions prior to living it out. And I really, really like that. That appeals to me a lot. <laughs> yeah. That's why, like, when I read this book, like, I thought it was more about, like, I don't know what I thought it was about, but I think it, I thought it was more just about simplification Yes. But it's really not like it's about finding your core values. Like it's really yeah. about making your life like automated to, to honor yourself, you know, yes. and who your family is and who your values are. Like it's so that those day to day decisions, that decision fatigue sort of minimizes and like you can be in the moment more because you're not afraid of what might happen or thinking about what just happened. You're right. just kind of there, you know. Yes in your happy boundaries. Yep, yep. <laughs> well, I love, I love this, uh, this last chapter talks about the bee, like just mm -hmm. kind of what we were just discussing, like how do you be in the moment or how do you um, be in this life? And um, I really like that. So it says, as these ideas become emotionally true, they take on the power to change you. And I think that just follows along with everything when we're talking about routines and habits and um, just changing our mindset. It just, it does, it changes you. I feel like I've definitely been changed reading this book. Just my thought process, um, the filter that I put everything through. I just feel like there's so much more of a clear vision for my life. And, and then when things come in, I don't feel so flustered by them. It just seems to be a little more clear. How would you yeah. say that it's changed you? I would totally, I mean, I, I think it's the same way. It's, it's this idea of, not being so wedded to to things unfolding the way I imagine it in my head yeah. and instead kind of like preparing for how I would like it to be but also like really acknowledging that if I don't do x y and z ahead of time like if I don't say the no if I don't prepare a routine like that this won't happen and then it's just angst awaiting me you know I also think another concept in the book that helped me was this idea that what will really matter to me? Like, will this really matter to me in like two or three years? You yeah. know, and that helps me with figuring out what's essential as well. You know, like even little things like classes my kids want to take or, you know, parties my friends want me to go to or whatever, these planning, th these commitments we make. Like, I really try to think like, is this going to be something that matters to me in like a few years? Mm -hmm. Because if it's not, then it's definitely not essential to me. Right. right. It's just not. Right. Yes. You know, like, I mean, that boils down to curricula, that boils down to classes, that boils down to even like a worksheet page. You know, yeah. like, do I need them to do this? Like, or do I not? Like, 
it's fine. You know, yeah. like it, it, even when you're in a power struggle with a kid, like over one yeah. thing, like, is this, is this comment that they make or is this like power struggle going to matter to me in a year or two or not? And if it's not, then really move forward from that, you know, like break yourself free of that, like emotional attachment to like every single problem in your life. Right. I think that's a big thing for this book, you know, like yes. in every moment, come back to your core values and yes, you know, let the yes. rest of it go. Right. 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 So. Well, and even like the worksheet thing you're talking about, like, is it worth it to, you know, maybe break this relationship because you're just struggling and fighting mm -hmm. together? Is it, is this one worksheet worth it? Or is this something that can definitely be, you know, removed or done some other way? That's the struggle. I think I have like, on applying this book on a daily basis because it's sometimes so hard for me when especially when you have your curriculum laid out and you need to do you know all of these things it's it's really hard for me to just say you know what i can tell he is getting frustrated or she's getting frustrated and now i need to just take a step back and this will be fine if we don't do this this week like because i want to check the boxes you know like i want to make everything happen and so i think on a daily basis it's really hard for me to find what's essential, um, especially going through a curriculum the first time, you know? For sure. I think having those minimum criteria, laying it out there is really helpful. And I actually haven't done that for curricula in a written form. Like I have it kind of in my head. So there's someone I follow on Instagram that I really respect and she has it laid out like in blocks. Like she has her six blocks on a page and she has for resources, for curricula, for classes. And she just has her three minimum criteria and her three like, you know, extreme criteria. And it's just written out like they're just six sentences, really. But I want to do something similar because I think having it written down gives you so much more accountability for what you're really doing. And I think for homeschool in particular, like where we continuously see like new things and new opportunities and classes and now with uh, with um quarantine we have so many online opportunities and everyone's like oh why aren't we learning x y and z i think that you know it's overwhelming if you have to like figure out your criteria every time Absolutely. as opposed to just seeing it so yes, that's yes. one of my goals from this book is to like put things down on paper in my planner so it's just there every single year and i just go forth from there I love that. I love that. Well, in wrapping this up, I think the end of this book kind of pointed out three things. And the essentialist lifestyle can bring more clarity, more control, and more joy in the journey. And isn't that just like mm -hmm. the perfect yes. wrap up of like what we've been talking about? It's perfect about? for your, your channel title. Ah, yeah, yeah, joyful journey. Oh my gosh, yes. I I don't even remember how I, how I picked that, but I will say that is that is still truly like what I aspire to and it is probably one of the hardest things when you homeschool because it's just like the daily grind and you forget so easily that you do want to delight in your kids and you want to have a joyful like a, a joy-filled time with them and um that can just be really hard when it's day after day after day. So this was yeah. fantastic. Do you have any closing thoughts? We should do this again. I don't. I think that, you know, I think one of the things that I loved about talking about it with you is because we both try really hard and fail often. <laughs> and I can say that so as your good friend, you know, like I think that trying is not the same as success, certainly, right. but it is very important, you know, like, and the more efficient and effective we can make our trying, the better. So I think this book gave me that, like yes. the ability to really like focus and hone my trying, yes. you know, like I think we'll always be trying. There is no perfect end, but like it really does give you direction yeah. for like, what are you trying to achieve? Like it makes yeah. you accountable to like, why are you doing this? You right. know? And well, I, I think that was my biggest takeaway from the book. It'll definitely be a book that I keep rereading. Like I'll keep reading what I've underlined, you know, just to keep my like mindset <laughs> like in, as an essentialist mindset. Yes. Like it's very easy to slip back into all the things. Oh so. yeah, yes, especially. And we had talked about this a little bit that some people definitely are are more comfortable with their no, and they're more comfortable with um, just knowing their kind of their their bandwidth, you know, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but I feel like 
if you struggle with that, this is a really great book. But even if you are pretty easy at saying no to things, if it comes pretty easily for you, there's still so much in this book, like we talked about, like just becoming an essentialist and what that all means. Um, because I think everybody struggles with that to some degree yeah. or another. And when it's constantly changing in your life, like homeschooling is not going to be my life forever, you know? And so, and you've had office experience, you've had homeschool experience, like you've had the gamut so far, who knows where you'll end up, you know? Um, so I just think this is, this is a great book to kind of reconsider every year. And, um, and when life changes, it's a really great book for helping make that a smoother transition. So. Yeah, I think it's talked about mostly in business circles, but I think it has yeah. great application for moms. Like yes. really, so, whether you homeschool or not. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Very true. All right. Well, this was, this super was great. Yes. This was super fun. Yeah. Thank, thank you for doing it with me, but we should do the next book. We should. What, what, what was it? Something about book. habit? Was it the power of habit? Am I making that up? Uh, it was, I, I did, uh, Clear habits? Was it? uh, what was it? The power of habit, I think. Yes. We should definitely do that again sometime. So yes. stay tuned, but thanks for exactly. joining us today, everyone. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. Hopefully this works out. And you guys, if you have any questions, leave them down in our comment boxes down below because, you know, we're happy to answer them. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, you have a lovely essentialist day, Tanya. You too. <laughs> you too. I wish you success. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye.